Chapter 23 Cardass had seen Darth Vader on occasion, back in the days when his smuggling organization was supplying Palpatine's freshly minted empire with data, but he'd never seen the Dark Lord this close, and he definitely had never seen him this angry. That was the agreement, Senior Captain, Vader ground out, leveling a finger at Thrawn across Governor Feruz's still-battered office. My assistance on your schedule, in exchange for the rebels. Yet they are gone. He swung the accusing finger a quarter of the way around the room to where Feruz sat quietly at his desk. And your forces also did nothing to stop them. My forces were also engaged in the battle, my lord, Feruz reminded him. We had no way of stopping them. I accept no excuses, Governor, Vader rumbled. He turned back to Thrawn. From anyone. I make no excuses, my lord, Thrawn assured him. But if you'll recall, our agreement was that I would deliver the rebel leadership. Surely you don't think they were gathered at Pawn Minor. The leadership, Vader broke off, looking again at Feruz. There are others in the rebel alliance besides their leadership that I also seek, he said, his voice oddly reluctant. I see, Thrawn said, his forehead wrinkling. My apologies, my lord. You said nothing of this to me beforehand. What does it matter? Vader said. The momentary reluctance vanished back into his stammering anger. They're gone. Information always matters, Thrawn told him. Bad information leads to bad tactics. Incomplete information leads to flawed strategy. Both can lead to defeat. He raised his eyebrows slightly. May I ask the name and identity of this person or persons of interest? What you may do is fulfill your side of the agreement, Vader said ominously. What you may do is deliver the rebel command. Governor? A voice asked tentatively from across the room. Cardass turned to see a young man standing in the ruined doorway, clearly wondering if he should enter the room, or perhaps whether he really wanted to. I have the data you requested. Give it to Senior Captain Thrawn, Feruz told him. Yes, sir. Hurriedly, the assistant crossed the room, making a wide circle around Vader, and handed Thrawn the data card. Thrawn already had his data pad out and as the assistant beat an equally hasty retreat, he slid the card into place. What data is this? Vader asked. Thrawn didn't answer. His glowing eyes narrowed in concentration as he manipulated the data pad's controls. It's the listing of the material Nuso Espa had me leave in the Enyatin and Lysanthri mining complexes for the rebel team to find, Feruz said. Slowly, Vader turned to face him. You gave them supplies. I was so ordered, my lord, Feruz said. Oddly enough, or at least oddly enough to Cardass's mind, the governor seemed almost calm in the face of Vader's quiet rage. Maybe he was simply the calm, imperturbable type, like Thrawn. More likely, it was the fact that his family was the most important thing in his life. Now that they were safe, even a Sith Lord's anger was almost inconsequential. Did you at least damage the equipment, Vader countered, or otherwise render it useless? He couldn't, Thrawn put in absently, his eyes still on the data pad. Nuso Espa couldn't anticipate when the Emperor's hand would arrive, nor when she would conclude her investigation and move against Governor Feruz. The rebels had to be given a reason to stay long enough for that to happen. For another few seconds, Vader's empty faceplate remained fixed on Feruz. Then, with a muffled sound that might have been a curse, he turned away. His eyes lingered for a moment on the gaping hole across the office that had once been Feruz's hidden escape hatch. Then, with another huff, he turned back to Thrawn. Well, Thrawn lowered the data pad. Here's what they took. In order of loading, cold weather equipment and cold weather modification kits, critical replacement parts for a Suro 10 power generator, a KDY DSS-02 shield generator, 
and some Atgar P-Tower laser cannons. They probably have at least one Golan Arms DF-9 anti-infantry cannon, along with several combat-modified T-47 airspeeders and the equipment to modify more. He paused expectantly. For a long moment, Bader just stood there, facing Thrawn, his stance giving no clue as to what was going on inside that black armor. Cardass felt himself tensing. A cold world, Vader said, his voice almost shocking in its quiet calmness. Not angry, not simmering, but merely thoughtful. Uninhabited, or nearly so. No useful resources. Thrawn inclined his head. I agree, my lord. Wait a minute, Ferus said, sounding confused. I understand the cold part, but how do you know it's uninhabited? The Suro and DSS-02 are designed to operate in the open, Vader said, his faceplate still turned to Thrawn. On a cold world, with no cover available, they would quickly be spotted anywhere except an uninhabited world, and any world with appreciable resources would hardly remain uninhabited. You know where to look for them, Thrawn said, and the knowledge that they'll be using Atgars. DF-9s and T-47s will enable you to tailor your attack for quick victory. Yes. Vader held out his hand. Pulling out the data card, Thrawn gave it to him. My lord, he said, inclining his head again. Captain? Vader turned and nodded to Ferus. Governor? Lord Vader? Ferus said, nodding back. Vader looked briefly at Cardass apparently decided he wasn't worth mentioning, and with a swirl of his cloak, strode from the office. Two minutes later, with Ferus's fervent thanks still ringing through his mind, Cardass followed Thrawn in the same direction. I presume you'll be heading back to the Admonitor? He asked as they reached the turbo lifts. Yes, Thrawn said. Nuso Espa's eastern fleet has been shattered, but he has two more of equal strength. I have to return immediately to seize our temporary advantage. Not to mention paying a visit to the Stama and Kisoth, Cardass murmured. I imagine they'll be more receptive to you now they know the truth. If not, they'll have only themselves to blame for the consequences, Thrawn said. What about you? Cardass grimaced. What about him? I don't know, he confessed. There's still one possibility way out on the Kathal Rift, that I've been told might let me put my life back together. But I don't know. Whether it can be done? Thrawn asked quietly. Or whether you want to try? Cardass snorted. I never could fool you, could I? Not often. The turbo lift car came, and they stepped inside. While you're considering whether or not your life has purpose, Thrawn continued as the car started down. There's one more job I would very much like you to do for me. Commander Pelion's report said that after Nuso Esva came aboard the Chimera, he made a short visit to the planet Runa, plus a longer one to a place they still haven't identified, Cardass said, nodding. Yes, I read the report. The unknown world is of no lasting importance, Thrawn said. That would have been the place Nuso Esfa chose to meet with his commanders and finalize his plans for the operation. But the other one, Runa, is where I believe Nuso Esfa's agents are holding Sorrow's family hostage. Possibly his entire town. Considering the legend of Saliban's hope, my hope is that Sorrow's family may still be alive and can be freed. Cardas felt his stomach tighten. By me. There's no one else who can do the job, Thrawn said. The Lost Reef has the weaponry, and I'm sure you have the necessary contacts to locate them. He eyed Cardass closely. The question is whether you have the will. The door opened, and they headed across the palace's main floor. Cardass watched the other employees as they walked past, noting the wondering looks and furtive glances. But no one stopped them. They reached the door passed between the 501st Legion stormtroopers standing guard there, and headed outside. Cardass thought one of the stormtroopers nodded to Thrawn as they passed, but it might have been his imagination. 
They were halfway to the outer wall before Cardass made up his mind. I suppose it wouldn't hurt to at least take a look, he said. There's an arms dealer named Besit on Runa, probably where Nuso Espa got the thermal detonators he used against the Chimera. I could start there. Thank you, Thrawn said, inclining his head. I'm certain Sorrow would have appreciated it, too, had he lived. Yes. Cardass looked sideways at Thrawn. By the way, I noticed you didn't mention to Vader that you were the one who ordered the Kaldorf 7 missiles taken off the Sarissa and sent to Pole Niner where Nuso Espa's people could grab them. Thrawn shrugged. Merely following Nuso Espa's own philosophy, he wanted the rebels to be so heavily invested in their newfound material wealth that they couldn't quickly or easily extract themselves. I wanted Nuso Espa to have the same incentive to assure he would bring his entire available force. Could have been awkward if those ships had gotten out intact, Cardass pointed out. I was counting on the rebels to destroy them, Thrawn said. I admit they did the job more inventively than expected, but the result was the same. Really, Cardass said, looking closely at him. Sounds like you're feeling more charitable against the rebellion these days. Not at all. Thrawn said, his tone going grim. Their military abilities are undeniable, but their chances for long-term stability are non-existent. Multiple species, with multiple viewpoints and racial philosophies, simply cannot hold power together for long. The dominant voice must certainly be wise enough to adopt ideas and methods from his allies and member peoples, but there must be a dominant voice or there is only chaos. In this part of the galaxy, that voice is the Empire. And in your part of space? Cardass asked. Thrawn shrugged slightly. A work in progress, he said. But we will succeed. His throat tightened. I've seen the future, George. We will succeed, because we have no other choice. Mara waited in the Swan Tech for two days before she regretfully concluded that Larone and the others weren't coming back. What had happened to them was still a mystery. She'd made inquires and checked all the Imperial databases, both the official and the not-so-official ones. But there was no sign of them. Had the 501st caught them after the battle, when Vader sent them down to handle security while Ferus and Yularno sorted out which of their people could be trusted? But Vader was a stickler for proper procedure, at least among his subordinates and someone should have filed a report somewhere. Major Pakri, then, or some of Nusso Espa's other agents? But Pakri was in hiding, and from the tap calf body count it seemed highly unlikely there were any of Nusso Espa's fellow aliens left to make trouble. Even if there were, and even if they'd managed to kill the stormtroopers, there was no reason for them to hide or dispose of the bodies. Mara had no idea how it had happened. But the fact was that they were gone. And so it was, at the end of the second day, that she found herself sitting in the Swan Tech's pilot seat, gazing moodily out at the spaceport beyond. Missing them. It was a new sensation, she thought, to miss someone. The only true constants she'd ever had in her life had been the Emperor and a handful of people like Vader. Vader she could take or leave, his moods permitting him to be an occasional ally but little more. The others of the court or fleet were the same. As for the Emperor, he was available any time she needed him, just the stretch of her mind away. She could hardly miss someone who was always there. She didn't like missing Larone and the others. It felt weak and vulnerable, and she didn't like it at all. But she missed them just the same. And what made it all the worse was the hard and bitter knowledge that whatever had happened to them had happened because of her. She was the one who'd ordered them here, and had then left them to stand alone against Nusso Esva's agents while she went after the governor's family. If she hadn't done that, she sighed. If she hadn't done that, who could tell what might have happened? Farah's family would probably be dead. The stormtroopers might still be dead. Mara herself might be dead. My child? Mara closed her eyes and stretched out to the force. My lord, she called back. Is all well? Mara hesitated, suddenly wanting very badly to tell him of her loss, to feel his strength and to be comforted. But he was the emperor. His responsibilities spanned a galaxy. He had no time for the softness of emotion or sorrow. And she was the Emperor's hand. Neither did she. All is well, my lord, she told him. 
Governor Pharos has been cleared. Excellent, the Emperor said. Return to Imperial Center. Yes, my lord, Mara said. The connection was broken. With a sigh, Mara keyed the panel for engine startup. She would take the Swan Tech out to where they'd left her shuttle, she decided, take it in tow, and head back to Imperial Center. There, she would return the Swan Tech to its rightful owners in the ISB. Or maybe she wouldn't. The ISB didn't know she had it, after all. Maybe she would instead stash it away somewhere in an out-of-the-way system, just in case she ended up needing it someday. Or in case, somehow, Larone and the others came back. The odds were small, she knew. But in this crazy universe, one could never be sure. Graves' injuries had been severe, and interrupting his Bacta treatment hadn't helped matters any. Fortunately, their current home's medical facilities were far better than the sub-miniature Bacta tank Chewbacca had lugged across Whitestone City from the Sawan Tech. Grave was out of the tank, dressed, and comparing scars with Quiller when Vontar arrived with the news that his master was ready to see them. Given the name of the ship and the crewers Larone had seen during their three days aboard, he wasn't really surprised to learn who that master was. Welcome aboard the Admonitor. Senior Captain Thrawn greeted them gravely as the stormtroopers filed into his command office. I'm told your injuries have been successfully treated. Very well treated, sir. Thank you, Lerone assured him. But your curiosity remains, Thrawn continued. It's very simple, Squad Commander Lerone. I brought you here because Vontar tells me you're excellent stormtroopers. I want you in my command. Lerone felt his mouth go dry. It was a very flattering offer especially coming from a commander who had so deftly turned certain defeat into resounding victory. But if Thrawn put in the request through the proper channels, there would be alarms going off all over Imperial Center, and the minute the ISB got wind of it, Marcross was obviously thinking the same thing. We appreciate the offer, Captain, he said, but there are a few problems with our situation that you may not be aware of. Our current position in the fleet is that you have no position, Thrawn finished. Technically, you're deserters. One of you is technically a murderer. And with that, Lerone knew it was finally over. They'd gotten past Jade, and they'd even gotten past Vader. But they were caught. In some ways, it was almost a relief. It was self-defense, sir, he said, though he wasn't sure why he was even bothering to try. The ISB wouldn't care what the circumstances had been. As to the desertion, I forced the others to go along with me. Thrawn raised an eyebrow. Vontar? I spoke to you of their loyalty to one another, the Traukri said. This is but one more example. Indeed, Thrawn said. But as you may recall, squad commander, I said you were only technically a murderer and a deserter. I've seen the various reports plus a quiet inquiry that was done by the Emperor's hand, and I believe I understand what happened. Lerone looked at Vontar in sudden understanding. Is that why you had Vontar kidnap us? So that you could keep all this off the record? Exactly, Thrawn said, sounding pleased. You did excellent work on Pawn Major. All of you did, for whatever good it did, Lerone said ruefully. From what I saw in the ship's after-action reports, the only reason Nuso Espo wanted to kill Feruz was to get you over to the pawn system so he could spring a trap. But the palace went ahead and issued the directive anyway, which I was happy to comply with, Thrawn said. As for what you accomplished, you helped save the life of a good and valuable man, along with the lives of his family. At the cost of another being's life, Brightwater murmured, looking at Vontar. Which he was more than willing to give, Vontar said gravely, as were we all. Beyond that, though, you need to understand the full scope of Nuso Espa's plan, Thrawn continued. If Governor Feruz had been murdered on schedule, his Pawn Major squad and their whisper-like fighter would have been on Pawn Minor when the full nest of missile-armed ships were launched. Their presence at the crucial moment might have saved some or all of those ships from destruction, but because you first delayed and then destroyed that particular squad, 
the other whisper likes were in fact destroyed. He smiled tightly, but even more important is the fact that with the Pawn Major Squad destroyed, the whisper like you retrieved at the spaceport was abandoned and therefore could be retrieved intact by Vantar and his warriors. Studying it will give us vital insights into Nuso Espa's technology and warship philosophy. I see, Thrawn said, feeling somewhat better. Maybe all their sound and fury hadn't been as useless as he'd been thinking. But warships are only part of the equation, Thrawn continued. Releasing Nuso Espa's slave peoples from his grip will also require ground troops. Not just any troops, but Imperial stormtroopers. Lerone glanced at the others. They seemed as underwhelmed by the offer as he was feeling. Once again, we appreciate the offer, sir, he said, looking back at Thrawn. But we've seen enough action. Possibly more than enough. Thrawn shook his head. You misunderstand me, squad commander. I don't want you to fight. I want you to train. Lerone felt his eyes widen. To train? Specifically to train people like Vantar, Thrawn said, gesturing to the Traukri. Their world has suffered greatly under Nuso Espa's domination, and the few who escaped have been strong and able allies. That was why I chose them to go to Pawn Major in the guise of refugees, to watch and report on the movements and activities of Nuso Espa's agents. But while they're excellent soldiers, they and I both agree that they can become better. They can become true Imperial stormtroopers. The image of Traukri's sacrifice in the Tapcalf cellar floated back to Lerone's mind. I have no doubt of that, sir. But surely the Admonitor already has its share of capable stormtroopers. So it does, Thrawn said. What it doesn't have is capable stormtroopers who can deal honestly and enthusiastically with the idea of aliens joining their ranks. And suddenly it all made sense. Lerone looked at the others again, then turned to Vontar. This is something you want? We do, the Traukri said firmly. The empire that Senior Captain Thrawn is carving into the evil that pervades our worlds is not the empire you choose to leave. His is an empire of justice and dignity for all beings. His empire is one we gladly serve. He looked at Thrawn. One we are willing to die for. The choice is of course yours, Thrawn said. We're still three days from my base. Think on it and discuss it. I'll await your decision. They were following Vontar back toward their quarters when Grave broke the thoughtful silence. I think we should name the new unit the 501st, he said. I thought Vader had that one locked down, Quiller pointed out. I somehow doubt Vader will ever know, Grave said. I'm sure not going to tell him. Wise choice, Marcross said. Any particular reason you want that number? Grave shrugged. They're supposed to be the best. If we're going to take this job, we might as well aim high. If we take the job? Lerone said. I don't think we've got a choice, Quiller said soberly. You read the reports, Lerone. You saw how Nuso Esfa operates. Kidnapping children, suborning Imperial officers, threatening to slag entire planets. The guy has to be stopped. And if people like Vontar are going to fight him anyway... Someone has to make sure they're the best fighters they can be, Marcross agreed. That someone might as well be us. Hence, the new 501st, Grave concluded, like I already said. Lerone looked over at Brightwater. The other was staring at the deck beneath them, his forehead wrinkled with concentration or perhaps regret. Brightwater, you're being awfully quiet, Lerone said. You having a problem with any of this? Um... Brightwater asked, his eyes refocusing on Lerone. Oh, no, I'm good. I was just wishing we'd had a chance to see Skywalker one last time before we left. Skywalker? Lerone asked, frowning. Why? He still got my lucky coin. Riken was sitting behind his desk, studying a data pad, when Han arrived at his office. Leia said you wanted to see me, he said. Leia said you wanted to see me. Riken said, 
laying down the data pad. I take it this is about the poem mission? Yes, Han said, planting himself in front of the desk. You still want me to be an officer? I've always wanted that, Riken said, taking Han's bluntness in typical calm stride. Especially now, he gestured to the data pad. I've been reading Colonel Kraken's report. He was very impressed by you, and he doesn't impress easily. Yeah, I know, Han said. So, okay, you want me, you've got me. Wonderful, Riken said, eyeing him closely. Any reason in particular for this change of heart, aside from your irritation at being left out of all the fun meetings? You told me leadership brings responsibility, Han reminded him. It's looking like I'm getting loaded with that responsibility anyway. I might as well get the stupid rank bars too. Okay, Riken said. I'll get the data work started right away. He held out his hand. Congratulations, Lieutenant Solo. Chewie was waiting by the Falcon, the ship's torn apart swivel blaster cannon on the deck at his feet. When Han got back to the hangar, we're in, Han confirmed, peering up into the cannon's now empty compartment. Go ahead and put in for the upgrade. I can sign for it now. The Wookiee warbled a question. I don't know, Han said, nudging the blackened pieces of the old cannon with his toe. Something by Blastek. I've always liked their stuff. Maybe a ground buzzer. Either the AX-108 or the 3. Just make sure you get something that isn't going to overheat and burn out the couplings every 50 shots. A movement from across the hangar caught his eye. He looked up to see Leia walking toward the rows of X-Wings, Luke and Wedge with her, both of them smiling as she waved her hands in emphasis to whatever it was she was telling them. Beside Han, Chewie rumbled. Absolutely, Han agreed watching as the others disappeared behind one of the other ships. Come on, let's get back to work. End of Choices of One by Timothy Zahn Thank you for listening to this unabridged audio presentation from the Star Wars Expanded Universe. The Decade Bird will fly again soon.